I request Mr. Lalit Man Singh to address the con convention. Hi, Commissioner Rajikant Verma, President Gopa Patnaik, all the distinguished members of the high table, my brothers and sisters from Orissa. It's always a great joy to be here with you. I remember five years ago, I took part in the Silver Jubilee celebrations of Osa. Uh, for High Commissioner Verma, I think it must be a strange experience to come to this vast tribal gathering of Oriyas. But let me explain to him, we are a very small state, and certainly compared to your state, UP, which had 130 million people, we are just about 30 million. So you'll excuse this sense of feeling very close, like one family. And so what you see here is an outpouring of sentiment, of feeling of pride about being Korea. And uh, I think you'll, you'll take it in this perspective. A uh, lot of people have referred to the millennium, and I think it's natural, because we are just six months away from the next millennium. And so our thoughts should go back to what we have been and what lies ahead. Now, before we answer that, I think we must ask another question. Who are we? And it's a question which has puzzled me because there is a somewhat feeble Oriya identity outside of yourself. And you and I must have suffered this many a time. So when people say, when, where are you from? You say, Orissa, and they say, well, where is that? So we must understand who we are and what is our real identity. I have gone into a lot of history and whatever writing is available. I have come to the conclusion that Oriyas are not a very homogeneous ethnic group. Uh, it may surprise us, but I think it's something which is, which is uh, a matter of pride. Some of our tribes in Orissa are amongst the oldest people in the world. The gods, for instance, uh, after whom Gondwana is named, are amongst the oldest Aboriginal people. And we have the Mundas and the Santhals and the Savars and so on. The bulk of the Oriyas came from a tribe called Odras, which is why it is called Odisha. But I, I think as our history progressed, we had a liberal mixture of blood from the Tamils of the South and from the Aryans of the North. And so we are a nice cocktail of ethnic groups which is uh, perhaps a good thing because I think it explains the cultural vitality of Orissa. Now, looking back, let me take you on a quick bus trip around Orissa's history and past. Let me start with the beginning of the Christian era. Uh, at the beginning of the first millennium, we see Orissa as a distinct geographical and political entity. It starts with Emperor Kharavela, 1st century BC, a, a great conqueror, a great leader, a great patron of arts. He, uh, his monuments are still visible in Bhuvaneshwar. Now, the greatness of Kharavela lies in the fact that he took pride in being the emperor of Kalinga. He called himself Aira Maharaja Mahameha Bahana. And it was for the first time that Orissa acquired a political identity. And thereafter, Kalinga has been quite famous in India's history. Skip a few generations, a few, few centuries, and you come to the 7th century. There is a mysterious dynasty called the Sailodhavas. Not much is known about them. But the important thing about the Sailodhavas is that they had maritime contacts with the whole of Southeast Asia. And there was an active interchange with, as the far-flung areas of Southeast Asia, Philippines, Indonesia, Java, Sumatra, Bali, Borneo, uh, Sri Lanka, Thailand, and so many other places. Now, come to the end of the first millennium, beginning of the second. 10th century, Orissa sees a great new dynasty called the Kesaris. Jajaji II, the great emperor of this, 
again consolidated his political position, established his capital there. Now, Jajati is famous because he conducted what is called the Ten Hot Sacrifice, the Tasastra of Medha Jagya. And he did that in a place called Viraja, after which that place is known as Jajpur because of the sacrifices. And Jajati is famous because he also built the Lingaraj temple in Bhuvaneshwar. Then comes another dynasty called the Gangas. And the Gangas are one of the greatest dynasties to rule India. They emerged around the 11th century, carried out from the 12th and the 13th century. Now, the Gangas were great builders, great conquerors. You have the first great emperor, the, the first one, first famous emperor in this line was Choroganga Dev, who had the Jagannath temple constructed and who established his capital in Qatar for the first time. And then you go on from Choroganga Dev to Narsimha Dev, who built the Konarak temple and so on. 14th century, you have a slight decline in Orissa. Orissa is attacked from all sides by the emerging Muslim kingdoms in northern India. 15th century, another period of glory for Orissa, the great Kapilandra Dev, whose empire stretched from the Ganges in the north to the Kaveri in the south. And it was he, having conquered so many territories, gave himself this very honorific title which is still carried by the Gajapati kings of, of Puri. He called himself Birasri Gajapati Godeshwara Navakota Karnata Kalavargeshwara. And this is a great title for the first time. Orissa's territory is expanded from north to south in such a, such a, a, a powerful fashion. Now, next 500 years are a period of decline for Orissa. Because steadily the political fortunes declined, Orissa got attacked from all sides. The 16th century, the Afghans conquered Orissa. 17th century, Orissa came under Mughal rule. Akbar's uh, brother in law and commander in chief, Raja Man Singh, no relation of mine, he, <laughs> he conquered Orissa. And Orissa remained under Mughal rule for more than 100 years. And after the Mughals came the Marathas. And after the Marathas came the British. And the British ruled Orissa from the beginning of the 19th century till we got independence in 1947. Now, 500 years of continuous decline, of dismemberment, of fragmentation of Orissa, that has left a traumatic uh, impact on the psyche of the Oriya people. So much so that in the beginning of this century, if you recall, Orissa was not a, a political entity at all. Orissa was a, a, a minor segment of a large province called Bengal, Bihar and Orissa. And a greater calamity was about to befall Orissa. It was decided by a group of Bengali administrators that Oriya was no longer a separate language. It was only a dialect of Bengali. Which is why the alarm bells started ringing. And you had these great leaders at the beginning of this century who took stock and thought of ways of how to preserve Oriya culture and the Oriya language. And I think it's important on this occasion to remember the contributions of these great people, Barrister Madhusudan Das, the Maharaja of Pala Kemendi, Maharaja K.C. Krishna uh, Chandra Gajapati, and the Maharaja Mayakman, Sri Ram Chandra Manjdev. If these people had not been alert, then we would have no Oriya language, we would have no Oriya culture, we would have no Orissa as a state. And therefore, we must be grateful to these people for having preserved Oriya culture for, from extinction. So we've had a state since 1936. Orissa became for the first time united after 500 years of dismemberment. Now look back on history. Sometimes one feels that you can review history according to your current interests and, and your, your, your uh, current values. If I look at Orissa's history, this is, a, since I'm not a professional historian, 
let me give you a personal perspective of how I see Orissa's history. For me, the greatest heroes of Orissa's history are not the conquerors who conquered kingdoms and killed people. I think the greatest heroes of Orissa's history are the people who went out in primitive boats and went and colonized Southeast Asia. It is these people who brought in prosperity for India, but we hardly know anything about them. These are the sadhavas of Odisha, who had a, an active maritime trade for nearly a thousand years. It is these people who carried Odisha's culture to the far-flung areas of the Southeast Asia. It is these people who carried the temple building traditions, which resulted in the great temples of Borobudur in presently in Indonesia, or Angkor Wat in, in Cambodia. I think they are the real and the unsung heroes of Orissa's history. And if I admire any of the great emperors I've mentioned, it is because not because they conquered kingdom or they vanquished the neighboring kingdoms of Bengal or Bihar or Andhra or any other place. I admire them because of what they have contributed to human history and culture. I admire them for having constructed the great temples of Orissa, the Lingaraj Temple, the Konarak Temple, the Jagannath Temple in Puri. This is the pride and glory of Odisha, not the conquest of neighboring kingdoms. And so, when we look back, we have to be proud of what we have been able to preserve against all odds. But when we are looking at the next century and the next millennium, what is it to be an Odisha? <coughs> My answer is today, Odisha has to submerge its culture and its identity with a greater identity of India. Because India can live without Orissa. Orissa cannot live without India. We are part of this great Indian tradition. We are part of the great culture of India. We are very much a contributor to the richness of India's heritage. And therefore, if I have any advice to give to my younger brothers and sisters, it is that let us look forward with great pride, no doubt, of what we have achieved. But the time has passed when we must think of ourselves as people who have distinct identities based on their village or their district or even their state. I say this because we need to be proud of belonging to Katak or Puri or Vaibhaj or Samalpur or Dekana, yes, even Dekana. We need to be proud of belonging to these places. But it is not important for us to treat the people in the next district as our enemies, as we have often done in our long history. It is no longer necessary for you to think of the Bengalis, the Biharis, and the Andras as your enemies. We are no longer under threat. Orissa's existence is not under threat. And therefore, I think the time has come to relax and say, we are Oriyas, we are proud of our temples, of our textiles, of our filigree work, of our wood carvings. We are proud of our cuisine. We are proud of everything that is Oriya. But it is still a part of the greater identity of India. And India is the country we want to love. Let me tell you why we should feel proud of our being India. I say so because we have had 50 years of independence. A lot of people ask, what have you achieved? There is still poverty, there is illiteracy, there is disease. But let us see where we were 50 years ago and where we are today. Remember that in Orissa's history, every four or five years there used to be a massive famine. You take the whole recorded history of the 17th century, the 18th century, of the 19th century. Every five years, ten years, there is a massive famine. Remember the Nongko Dhuvikya of Odisha, when more than a million people died in 1865. But it was not the end of the famines. The famines continued year after year, decade after decade. 1942, there was another massive famine, where thousands of people died. So this is what we were when we acquired independence. A country which was not able to feed its starving millions of people. We depended on charity. This year, we have we are going to harvest 205 million tons of food grains, the highest 
production ever recorded in India's history. From being a food importing country, we are going to be a food surplus and a food exporting country. The same thing about industry. We were a colonial economy when we started in 1947. We were exporters of raw materials, importers of finished products. What have you achieved today? It is the reverse. We are a big industrial nation. I don't know how many of you have noticed that in the last, uh, the latest review, which has come out of the World Bank, it lists the industrial nations in terms of purchasing power parity. And according to that, the number one industrial economy in the world, undoubtedly, is the United States, about $8 trillion worth of GDP. Next, according to this new formula, comes China, with something like $3.8 trillion of GDP. Next comes Japan, with $3.1 trillion. Next comes Germany, with $1.8 trillion. And close behind Germany is India, with something like $1.7 trillion worth of GDP. This is what we have achieved from a zero status to reaching the number five position of industrial economies in the world. And what kind of industries? Not just manufacturing, not routine manufacturing, but high technology. The frontiers of technology have now been acquired by India. Whether you talk of space technology, of telecommunications, computers, of nuclear physics, all these are areas in which India has excelled. And India is today counted amongst the handful of countries which have the highest technologies in these areas. Let us look at our economic situation. For decades, we were dismissed as a basket case that India can only grow at a Hindu rate of growth of 2.5%, 2%. Of 2.5%, 2%. We have gone beyond the Hindu rate of growth. We have, for the past decade, we have been growing at the rate of 6 to 7% a year. Remember, the last year was a terrible year for the economies of the world, when most of the advanced economies were struggling to stay afloat. The much touted tiger economies of Southeast Asia were in shambles. So were the economies of Latin America. India had a bad year. But a bad year meant that we recorded only 6% rate of growth. That wasn't a bad year at all. Because there are few other countries in the world which recorded this. For a people, for a population of a billion people to grow at 6% is not bad at all. We have comfortable foreign exchange reserves. We have $33 billion worth of reserves. Our rupee is stable and strong. And so we have today a self-confident and uh, a, a robust economy which is looking forward to the 21st century. There is one difference that I want to underline, which is that if you look at India's history, it is a history of invasions of India. Repeatedly, India has been attacked and invaded. The Aryans came, the Shakas came, the Boons came, the Central Asians came, the Afghans came, the Iranians came, the Arabs came, the Mughals came, everybody came. Then the Europeans came, the Dutch, the French, the English, who dominated us for nearly 200 years. So, people thought that maybe Indians have a genetic defect. They can't stand up and fight. Well, maybe so, but there comes a time when even the worm turns. There comes a time when even a chicken stands up and instead of running away, stands up and fights. And that moment has come today in India. I say this with reference to what is happening on our northern borders. Yes, even in, in, in the time of independence, we have been invaded. In 1947, our neighbor Pakistan invaded Kashmir and still is in occupation of one third of the state of Jammu and Kashmir. In 1962, the Chinese came and they are still in occupation of our territory. But today, things have changed. Today, India is determined to stand up and defend itself. India is determined to stand up and fight. The reason why, the reason why we acquired nuclear weapons last year was because we came to the realization that in this world, you have to defend yourself. There's nobody coming to your help. There are other countries which preach to us about non-proliferation because they have a nuclear umbrella. India doesn't have a nuclear umbrella. 
Nobody has offered protection to India. And therefore, India must strengthen its defenses and must acquire everything that is required to defend its one billion people. And so what is happening in Kargil today is symptomatic of our new resolve. We will not let the past happen again. Every inch of Kargil, although you might say, what is there in this, in this mountainous wasteland where not a blade of grass grows? But Kargil, every inch of Kargil is a part of the soul of India and it has to be defended. Therefore, I want you to think of yourself as Odias, but Odias as a part of the greater nation of India, the greatest democracy that the world has seen. And we look forward to the 21st century. And when we meet in OSA next year, we will be toasting the century for India. And I think it is coming. Thank you.